Okay, now we know in theory what the hash function is. So let's talk about how we can construct a hash function. So there are some methods, but uh, we can also create a hash function from a block cipher. So let's first see how I can convert a block cipher into a hash function. Because a block cipher is not a one-way function, but we can modify it. And a block cipher uses a secret key, a hash function does not. So we can do some little modifications and turn a block cipher into a hash function. So it is possible to construct a hash function from a block cipher where we repl replace the compression function with the block cipher encryption algorithm. So why would, should we do such a thing? If we already deployed a block cipher, for instance, especially on a hardware, we might consider building a hash function from it because we can make security claims about the hash function using the analysis of the block cipher. Also, we can say space and implementation effort by reusing some of the components of the block cipher. Okay, so this is the idea. However, hash functions constructed from block ciphers are generally slower than a hash function with a dedicated design. And generally in practice, nowadays, I don't see people using this. So let's look how this works. Hash function from block ciphers. A corporation function has two inputs. The chaining variable h and the message m, where compression function takes the previous chaining value and the current message block. Okay. A block cipher has two inputs, key and the plain text, and outputs the cipher text. See, as you can see, we can put key and the plain text block here and provide the next chaining value h, which will be the cipher text. So in a picture, I will show that which will be. Meaningful. So if you try to form, you know, uh, something like this, then we can replace each, you know, secret key, plain text, cipher text with one of the variables, hi minus one, mi, and this, and so on. So this gives you actually 64 different ways to create a hash function. Out of these 64 possibilities, people considered all of them and realized that 12 of them are look secure. But three of them are have particularly important because in the literature we see them. They're not mentioned much, but you can find them. These are Davies Mayer, Matthias Mayer Ossias, and Mia Gucci Prenel uh, constructors. So instead of explaining, let's look at the picture. So this is a block cipher. Okay. It has two inputs, you know, plain text and the secret key, and provides the cipher text, right? So two inputs, one output. So WSMR modifies it like this. So as the input, you since as a hash function, you have a single input, right? This is the message you want to hash. So MI is the message you want to hash, and you divide it into blocks. And here you feed it as if it is the secret key to the block cipher. And the previous chaining value, initially you start with an IV if you don't have anything. Or you can use the secret key, okay? You put it here. You provide one output. At this point, it is you know one. It is not a one-way function. It is a bijection. But if you exhort it like this, now you provide hi. Okay. If you have more blocks to hash, take this, put it here, take the next message block. You keep this, and at the end of the day, you produce this. If your block size is one hundred and twenty-eight bits, you produce one hundred and twenty-eight bit hashing value. So you cannot go from here backwards because you don't know any of these two values, so you cannot go back. Right? This is the idea. This is what, how you turn a block cipher into a one-way function. So if you change the places of this, like here, so instead of key, giving your message as the secret key, you can now give it as the uh, plain text, but here you HI becomes your secret key for your encryption, okay? So a very similar idea, you just flip the places. And in the third one, this is Matthias Mero says, we add another line here, another XOR, Mia Gucci Prenel construction. I'm just giving these for historical reasons. You don't need to use them. Let's see what we use in practice. Generally, what we use is a, a iterated hash function. So many hash functions adopt an iterative design to accommodate a variable length input. merkle damgard construction is the most famous one. In this merkle damgard construction, message M is divided into fixed length blocks like this, okay? And these are generally large blocks like 512 bits or something. Then you apply a suitable padding. Message blocks are compressed one after the other to produce HI using a compression function F. 
HI is called the chaining variable and used in the compression of next message block, MI plus one. Compression function uses MI and HI minus one to produce HI, as in the previous case, okay? So H0 is fixed and specialized as a part of the hash function specifications. Generally, it is IV and put it in the uh, standardization documents. And uh, sometimes a finalization operation is applied to overcome some attack. So I explained this, but it is not easy to understand. So it will be very clear when we look at this picture, okay? So ID is as follows. You have a message M. This is the thing that you want to test. This can be a file on your computer, you know, anything. So you apply a padding like we did in the block ciphers, okay? So you end up with message blocks like this. So you have a compression function F, which takes two inputs and provide one output, okay? So the input size might be a lot larger. This is why we draw it like this. But the output is fixed. The size is fixed, sorry, not the output, but the size of it. So maybe it is 256. So if you have one more block, you take this output and feed it as the input and take this one. You continue this way and at the end you produce the hash from here. So when you hear hash functions like MD5, SHA1, SHA2, they are actually these F functions, okay? So SHA2, you put it here and that is the idea, okay? So this is actually, you can think of this, if we consider like the block cipher, this is your mode of operation actually, okay? SHA2, SHA3, MD5, they are just F functions here, the compression functions in other words, okay? So in literature, almost everything was like this. MD4, MD5, SHA1, RIPEMD, SHA2, they are all designs like this. So when we needed a, another hash function, uh, there was a competition and some of the designs used a different approach. Instead of the merkel damgard construction, they said that we are going to use the new ideas coming from sponge functions and we will turn them into hash functions. So SHA3 is a sponge function and it works like this, okay? This is how you construct a hash function from a sponge function. So in this picture, MI are input, ZI at the end will be your hash output. So there will be a variables like C and R, which C is capacity, R is rate, okay? And it works like this. So you have a very huge internal state. Generally, it is filled with IV and so on initially. And you start exhorting your message blocks to R bits at a time, okay? You exhort it with these R bits, then perform some permutation operations like S boxes, you know, permutations and so on. This way you provide confusion and diffusion to this internal state, okay? If you have one more block, you add it again, exhort it, then perform this uh, permutation operation again. So we call this the absorbing phase because you are feeding the message here. So think about really a real sponge and you are filling it with water, okay? So when, you, uh, when your message ends, you perform the F operation again. Now you produce the uh, this R bits from the top as Z0. Okay, maybe R is 64 bits, but you want to produce 256 bit output. So you have to provide more outputs to form 256 bits. So here you are squeezing the sponge and some water goes outside. Okay, you perform the F function again, you squeeze it again, and so on. This way you are feeding the uh, message from here and releasing the output from here. Okay. Compared to Merkel-Damgard construction, this is a very different approach. 